Good evening, everyone. I'm going to ask uh, for those of you that are on the uh, webinar to click on the green yes button if you can hear me. All right. Thank you all very much. We are gonna we're gonna go ahead and get started with the webinar. Uh, so this is the Quest for Success Teacher Refresher Session or Training Session, and uh, the reason that you are attending this webinar is uh, is because you were on the wait list for the July training, and now uh, you have received a spot in the September training that's coming up on September sixteenth and September seventeenth. So for introductions, my name is Ted Holmes, and I am a manager of the Jumpstart program here at the Louisiana Department of Education. Currently in my work, actually, excuse me for a second. I'm getting a feedback from someone on the call. Okay, that's better. <laughs> uh, so before doing this work, I was in the Army for 20 years where I worked uh, mainly with information technology and I helped to uh, mentor and lead young adults many times who came from high school. Uh, they weren't the students that you would typically see going to a university. And so I spent the last 20 years uh, helping to lead these young adults into careers of their own after the military. I've been at the department for about a year. It's where I've become the course manager for Quest for Success. So I oversee all things related to the course, uh, including uh, helping to work with the curriculum, helping to plan and lead training uh, throughout the state, as well as uh, many other things concerning with our Jumpstart program in the Louisiana Department of Education. Just a few uh, timeline things just to be aware of. So tonight, uh, you should receive an email uh, from, from me through Eventbrite with a link that will allow you to be able to register uh, for the September training. The training is from September 16th through September 17th. It's going to begin at 8 a.m. and it's going to end uh, by 4 p.m. on both days. You must attend both days of training and you may stay for the complete training. Uh, this webinar will be posted on the quick um, on the Quest for Success website, which is on the LDOE website uh, tomorrow. For those of you that may have missed the training tonight, on August twenty second, the registration for waitlist teachers will close. So right now, those of you who are, who are on the waitlist have priority to register for training. On August 29th, we're going to open up the training to the remaining of the public if any other training seats exist. Uh, if no training seats remain on the 29th, there's still going to be a wait list that's going to open and a wait list as well as the registration is going to close on September 5th. So if anyone asks you, your administrators, please let them know this timeline that's going on right now. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to turn the webinar over to London Moore. I'm going to let her introduce herself. Take it away, London. Good evening, everyone. I hope that everyone's having a good night. And if you worked at school today, having a very good day um, at the end of the school day. I am currently um, in Atlanta, moving one of my former students into Morehouse. Um, I have been a principal for the past seven years. Um, I have also worked um, in curriculum and development for the past 10. And then I will 
be taking on a new role as director of schools in Nairobi, Kenya in November. So I tell people often that I think one of the what you see there is like two pictures um, of different students of mine. And then on the left, you'll see students who just graduated who very much went through this idea that we'll talk about later about like not only student development and exploration of self, but the idea of college and career. As we talk more about Quest this evening, it's really a bigger mindset shift of what does it mean to really educate students in college and career rather than the way we've thought about it previously of college or career. So two of those students that you see to the left, um, both of them did the core four um, and so are both in university right now, but also both got welding certifications or are almost at welding certifications so that they have options. The students you see on the right are students that I've worked with in Ghana where we've had a very similar mindset adoption that it's about college and career. Um, so not only have the credentials to go to a four year university, but also have the ability to work in a variety of fields um, that are more technical. So as we go through the evening, we're really gonna think through what does it mean to prepare students to understand self and have self exploration in that time to do that, but then also to prepare them for college and career so that they can understand what that means to have options in both. Um, rather than just one or the other, which tends to be the way we've thought about it in the past. Um, a few things, obviously this is an online training, which is a little bit more challenging than when we do it in person. It's just something to immediately call out. And we're trying, uh, Ted and I are trying to reduce what is typically a two day training into about two hours. So please um, join with us in using the chat box. That's kind of gonna be how we communicate this evening um, and I definitely need feedback from you all as we're going through the presentation. So definitely um, make use of the chat box when we come to certain questions that we're going to come through. Um, Ted, you can head to the next slide. So this is the first time we're actually going to use the chat box. So if you, I think there are now about 20 or so of you on, please type into the chat box what your first job was as question one. I can see some of you doing it now, which is amazing. Um, and then what skills did it take for you in that job? I know for me, my first job was working at Hollywood Video, which no longer exists. Um, but that first job very much included things like customer service. It included being able to have, um, people skills that involved communication. It included organization. Um, so take a second, we're going to take about a minute or two, and please just type into the box what your first job was and then the skills that it took to do that job successfully. Thank you, Donna. I, I hear that. Oh, parking supervisor, okay. I need to know more what the rainbow play system is. I see a lot of restaurants. Oh, Gwen, you were way ahead of the rest of us. Working for the IRS was your first job. I'm impressed. And thank you for making sure to add in what the the different um, skills you needed, where I'm definitely seeing things like communication, which is a huge one. Ted, I didn't know you worked at Whataburger. That's awesome. Yep, a lot of marketing, communications. And so interesting, when I'm seeing you all go through these, um, similar to things we've talked about when we were building this curriculum, that very much, and similar to things we talked about when we were talking to different industry partners, when we were creating the curriculum, this idea of communication, organization, personal relations, financial literacy, those being big skills that no matter what organization, what company people are working for, they're looking for that in the students that come, that come from being students to mid-level employees. And what we're seeing is that students are struggling more with this idea of like communications, personal relations in a way that companies are very much feeling. And then we have to step back and ask ourselves, are we really teaching them that in schools like 
to the degree that companies are looking for. So I very much appreciate that I'm seeing across the board. I think almost everybody I'm looking in the chat put communication, but are we really teaching students communication? We're definitely teaching students a lot of things in our classes, but pointedly teaching communication and organization, I can't say we solidly have classes that do that every day in a deep way. So that is definitely part of this course. So thank you for engaging in the chat box. I appreciate that. If we keep engaging in the chat box like this, we definitely will be done faster than two and a half hours, I will tell you that. Um, oh, I like, I like the make change, so true. So true. Um, Ted, you can head over to the next slide. So what we're gonna watch quickly together and engage with um, is a video by, or a TED talk by Sir Ken Robinson. I think I have watched this probably at least 10 times in almost every ed setting I've been in for the last like six or seven years. So I apologize if somebody has seen this more than once, um, but I want you to think about, and we're gonna type into the chat at the end of this, um, two questions. One, what is sticky for you about this video? And sticky just means, of course, what stuck with you. Um, we talk a lot in this course or in general about what it means to really have things stick with students when we're talking to them about them. And then thinking about how could a course on self-exploration um, and career benefit this particular generation. So we're gonna watch this TED Talk and then as we're watching, you can feel free to type your responses into the chat. And then at the end, we'll also have about two minutes so you can synthesize your thoughts before I kind of share out about them. So Ted, you can go ahead and play the video. How are you? It's been great, hasn't it? It's been, I've been blown away by the whole thing. In fact, I'm leaving. Uh, <laughs> um, there have been three themes, haven't there, running through the conference, um, which are re relevant to what I want to talk about. One is the extraordinary evidence of human creativity in all of the presentations that we've had and, and in all the people here. Uh, just the, you know, the variety of it and the range of it. Uh, the second is that it's put us in a place where we have no idea what's going to happen uh, in terms of the future. No idea how this may play out. Uh, I have an interest in education. Uh, actually, what I find is everybody has an interest in education. Don't you? I find this very interesting. If you're at a dinner party and you say you work in education, actually, you're not often at dinner parties, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Sort of thing. If you work in education, you're not asked, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and you're never asked back, curiously, that's the <laughs> thing that strikes me. Uh, but if you are, and you say to somebody, uh, you know, they say, what do you do? And you say, you work in education, you can see the blood run from their face. They think, oh my God, you know, why me? <laughs> <laughs> my one night out all week. Um, <laughs> But if you ask people about their education, they pin you to the wall. Because it's one of those things that goes deep with people. Am I right? Like religion and money uh, and other things. So um, I have a big interest in education, and I think we all do. Uh, we have a huge vested interest in it, partly because it's education that's meant to take us into this future that we can't grasp. If you think of it, children starting school this year will be retiring in 2065. Nobody has a clue, despite all the expertise that's been on parade for the past four days, what the world will look like in five years' time. And yet we're meant to be educating them for it. So the unpredictability, I think, is extraordinary. And the third part of this is that we've all agreed, nonetheless, on the really um, extraordinary capacities that children have, their capacities for innovation. I mean, Serena last night was a marvel, wasn't she? Just seeing what she could do. And She's exceptional, but I think she's not, um, so to speak, exceptional in the whole of, of childhood. What you have there is a person of extraordinary dedication who found a talent. And my contention is all kids have tremendous talents, and we squander them pretty ruthlessly. 
Um, so I want to talk about education, and I want to talk about creativity. My contention is that creativity now is as important in education as literacy, and we should treat it with the same status. Thank you. Th that was it, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, 15 minutes left. <laughs> Well, I was born... No, the... Um... <laughs> I had a great story recently, uh, I love telling it, of a little girl who was uh, in a drawing lesson. She was six, and she was at the back drawing, and the, the teacher said, this little girl hardly ever paid attention. And in this drawing lesson, she did. And uh, the teacher was fascinated. She went over to her and she said, what are you drawing? And the girl said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the girl said, they will in a minute. <laughs> when, <laughs> when my son was four in England, actually he was four everywhere to be honest, I mean, really, <laughs> if we're being strict about it, wherever he went he was four that year, but he was in the nativity play, do you remember the story? No, it was big, it was a big story. Mel Gibson did the sequel, you may have seen it. <laughs> Nativity 2. But um, James got the part of Joseph, which we were thrilled about. We considered this to be one of the lead parts. Uh, we had the place crammed full of agents and T-shirts, you know. James Robinson is Joseph. Uh, we had. He didn't have to speak, but do you know the bit where the three kings come in? Now, they come in bearing gifts, and they, they bring gold, frankincense, and mare. This really happened. We're sitting there, and they, I think, just went out of sequence. Because we talked to the little boy afterwards and said, you know, are you okay with that? And they said, yeah, why was that wrong? They just switched, I think that was it. Anyway, the three boys came in, little four-year-olds with tea towels on their heads, and they put these boxes down. The first boy said, I bring you gold. And the second boy said, I bring you mare. And the third boy said, Frank sent this. What these things have in common is, is that kids will take a chance. You know, if they don't know, they'll have a go. Am I right? They're not frightened of being wrong. Now, I don't mean to say that being wrong is the same thing as being creative. What we do know is, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. If you're not prepared to be wrong. And by the time they get to be adults, most kids have lost that capacity. Uh, they have become frightened of being wrong. And we run our companies this, by the way. We stigmatize mistakes. And we're now running national education systems where mistakes are the worst thing you can make. And the result is that we are educating people out of their creative capacities. Picasso once said this. He said that all children are born artists. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. I believe this passionately, that we don't grow into creativity, we grow out of it or rather we get educated out of it. So why is this? Um, uh, I lived in Stratford-on-Avon uh, until about five years ago. In fact, we moved from Stratford to Los Angeles. So you can imagine what a seamless transition you know, this was from <laughs> LA. Actually, we lived in a place called Snitterfield, uh, just outside Stratford, which is where Shakespeare's father was born. Are you struck by a new thought? I was. You don't think of Shakespeare having a father, do you? Do you? Because you don't think of Shakespeare being a child. Dude, Shakespeare being seven. I never thought of it. I mean, he was seven at some point. He was in somebody's English class, wasn't he? <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> <laughs> really? How annoying would that be? You know? <laughs> really? <laughs> Must try harder. <laughs> the, um, being sent to bed by his dad, you know, to Shakespeare, go to bed now, you know, to William Shakespeare, you know, and put the pencil down, you know, and stop speaking like that. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's confusing everybody. <laughs> anyway, um, we moved from Stratford to Los Angeles, and I just want to say a word about the transition. Actually, my son uh, didn't want to come. I've got two kids. Uh, he's 21 now, and my daughter's 16. He didn't want to come uh, to Los Angeles. He loved it, but he had a girlfriend in England. Uh, this was the love of his life, Sarah. He'd known her for a month. 
Mind you, they've had their fourth anniversary. <laughs> because it's a long time when you're 16. Anyway, he was really upset on the plane. He said, I'll never find another girl like Sarah. And we were rather pleased about that, frankly. Because <laughs> she was... <laughs> she, was, she was the main reason we were leaving the country. But, uh, But something strikes you when you move to America and when you travel around the world. Every education system on earth has the same hierarchy of subjects. Everyone, doesn't matter where you go, you think it would be otherwise, but it isn't. At the top are mathematics and languages, then the humanities and the bottom are the arts, everywhere on earth. And in pretty much every system too, there's a hierarchy within the arts. Art and music are normally given a higher status in schools than drama and dance. There isn't an education system on the planet that teaches dance every day to children the way we teach them mathematics. Why? Why not? I think this is rather important. I think maths is very important, but so is dance. Children dance all the time, if they're allowed to. We all do. We all have bodies, don't we? Yeah. Did I miss a meeting? I mean, I think... <laughs> Truthfully, what happens is, as children grow up, we start to educate them progressively from the waist up. And then we focus on their heads, and slightly to one side. If you were to visit education as an alien and say, what's it for, public education, I think you'd have to conclude, if you look at the output, you know, who really succeeds by this? Who does everything they should? Who gets all the brownie points? You know, who are the winners? I think you'd have to conclude the whole purpose of public education throughout the world is to produce university professors. Isn't it? They're the people who come out the top. And I used to be one. So there. You know. <laughs> but... And I like university professors, but, you know, we shouldn't hold them up as the, uh, the, the high watermark of all human achievement. They're just a form of life. You know, another form of life. But they're rather curious, and I say this out of affection for them. There's something curious about professors. In my experience, not all of them, but typically, they live in their heads. They live up there, and slightly to one side. They're disembodied, you know, in a kind of literal way. You know, they, they look upon their body as a form of transport for their heads. <laughs> You know, it's... Don't they? It's a way of getting their head to meetings. <laughs> if you want real evidence of out-of-body experiences, by the way, get yourself along to a residential conference for senior academics and pop into the discotheque on the final night. <laughs> and <laughs> there you will see it. Grown men and women writhing uncontrollably. <laughs> off the beat. Wait until it ends so they can go home and write a paper about it. <laughs> now, our education system is predicated on the idea of academic ability. And there's a reason. The whole system was invented around the world. There were no public systems of education really before the 19th century. They all came into being to meet the needs of industrialism. So the hierarchy is rooted on two ideas. Number one, that the, the most useful subjects for work are at the top. So you were probably steered benignly away from things at school when you were a kid, Things you liked, on the ground, you would never get a job doing that. Is that right? Don't do music, you're not going to be a musician. Don't do art, you won't be an artist. Uh, benign advice. Now, profoundly mistaken. The whole world is engulfed in a revolution. And the second is academic ability, which has really come to dominate our view of intelligence, because the universities designed the system in their image. If you think of it, the whole system of public education around the world is a protracted process of university entrance. And the consequence is that many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not. Because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. And I think we can't afford to go on that way. In the next 30 years, according to UNESCO, more people worldwide will be graduating through education than since the beginning of history. More people. And it's the combination of all the things we've talked about, technology and its transformational effect on work, and demography and the huge explosion in population. Suddenly, degrees aren't worth anything. Isn't that true? When I was a student, if you had a degree, you had a job. If you didn't have a job, it's because you didn't want one. And I didn't want one, frankly. So, um, but now, kids with, with degrees are often heading home uh, to carry on playing video games. Because you need an MA, where the previous job required a BA, and now you need a PhD for the other. It's a process of academic inflation, and it indicates the whole structure of education is shifting beneath our feet. We need to radically rethink our view of intelligence. We know three things about intelligence. One, it's diverse. 
We think about the world in all the ways that we experience it. We think visually, we think in sound, we think kinesthetically. Uh, we think in abstract terms, we think in movement. Secondly, intelligence is dynamic. If you look at the interactions of a human brain, as we heard yesterday from a number of presentations, intelligence is wonderfully interactive. The brain isn't divided into compartments. In fact, creativity, which I define as the process of having original ideas that have value, more often than not, comes about through the interaction of different disciplinary ways of seeing things. The brain is intentionally... By the way, there's a shaft of nerves that joins the two halves of the brain called the corpus callosum. It's thicker in women. Following on from Helen yesterday, I think this is pro probably why women are better at multitasking. Because you are. Aren't you? There's a raft of research, but I know it from my personal life. If my wife is cooking a meal at home, which is not often, <laughs> thankfully, but, you know, if she's doing... <laughs> <laughs> no, she's good at some things. But if she's cooking, you know, she's dealing with people on the phone, she's talking to the kids, she's painting the ceiling, you know, she's <laughs> doing open heart surgery over here. If I'm cooking, the door is shut, the kids are out, the phone's on the hook. If she comes in, I get annoyed. I say, Terry, please, I'm trying to fry an egg in here. You know, <laughs> if, if, <laughs> Give me a break. Actually, there was a, do you know that old phil philosophical thing? If a tree falls in a, in a forest and nobody hears it, did it happen? Remember that old chestnut? I saw a great T-shirt, really, recently, which said, um, if a man speaks his mind in a forest and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and the third thing about intelligence is it's distinct. I'm doing a new book at the moment called Epiphany, which is uh, based on a series of interviews with people about how they discovered their talent. I'm fascinated by how people got to be there. Uh, it's really prompted by a conversation I had with a wonderful woman who may, most people have never heard of. She's called Gillian Lynn. Have you heard of her? Some have. She's a choreographer and everybody knows her work. She did Cats and Phantom of the Opera. She's wonderful. I used to be on the board of the Royal Ballet in England, as you can see. And uh, Anyway, Gillian and I had lunch one day. I said, how did you get to be a dancer? And she said it was interesting. When she was at school, she was really hopeless. And the school in the 30s wrote to her parents and said, we think Gillian has a learning disorder. She couldn't concentrate, she was fidgeting. I think now they'd say she had ADHD. Wouldn't you? But this was the 1930s, and ADHD hadn't been invented you know, at this point, so it wasn't an available condition. You know, people, <laughs> people, <laughs> people weren't aware they could have that. Anyway, she sent, went to see this, um, this specialist. So this oak-panelled room, and, and she was there with, uh, with her mother, and she was led and sat on this uh, chair at the end, and she sat on her hands for 20 minutes while this man talked to her mother about all the problems Gillian was having at school. And at the end of it, um, because she was disturbing people, her homework was always late and so on, a little kid of eight. In the end, uh, the, uh, the doctor went and sat next to Gillian and said, Gillian, I've listened to all these things that your mother's told me. I need to speak to her privately. So she said, he, he said, wait here, we'll be back, we won't be very long, and, and, uh, and they went and left her. But as they went out the room, he turned on the radio that was sitting on his desk. And when they got out the room, he said to her mother, just stand and watch her. And um, the minute they left the room, she said she was on her feet, moving to the music. And they watched for a few minutes, and he turned to her mother, and he said, you know, Mrs. Lynn, Gillian isn't sick, she's a dancer. <laughs> Take her to a dance school. I said, what happened? said, she did. I can't tell you how wonderful it was. We walked in this room, and it was full of people like me. People who couldn't sit still. People who had to move to think. Who had to move to think. They did ballet, they did tap, they did jazz, they did modern, they did contemporary. She was eventually auditioned for the Royal Ballet School. She became a soloist. She had a wonderful career at the Royal Ballet. She eventually graduated from the Royal Ballet School, found, found her own company, the Julian Lynn Dance Company, met Andrew Lloyd Webber, she's been responsible for some of the most successful musical theatre productions in history, she's given pleasure to millions, and she's a multi-millionaire. Somebody else might have put her on medication and told her to calm down. <laughs> now, I think... <laughs> what I think it comes to is this. Al Gore spoke uh, the other night about ecology and the revolution that was triggered um, by Rachel Carson. I believe our only hope for the future is to adopt a new conception of human ecology, one in which we start to reconstitute our conception of the richness of human capacity. 
Our education system has mined our minds in the way that we've strip mined the earth for a particular commodity. And for the future, it won't serve us. We have to rethink the fundamental principles on which we're educating our children. There was a wonderful quote by Jonas Salk who said, if, you were to, uh, if all the insects were to disappear from the earth, uh, within 50 years, all life on earth would end. If all human beings disappeared from the earth, within 50 years, all forms of life would flourish. And he's right. What Ted celebrates is the gift of the human imagination. We have to be careful now that we use this gift wisely and that we avert some of the scenarios that we've talked about. And the only way we'll do it is by seeing our creative capacities for the richness they are and seeing our children for the hope that they are. And our task is to educate their whole being so they can face this future. By the way, we may not see this future, but they will. And our job is to help them make something of it. Thank you very much. Bravo. Here, here. Thank you. So I hope you all um, enjoyed that TED talk. Every time I watch it, I feel like I get something additional from it. So if we can just take two minutes and either write something that was sticky to you in the box of something that really stuck with you, um, or if you could write how you think a course about self-exploration um, and career would benefit this generation. So take a second to just write it in the box. Um, and I'm gonna share out just some of the pieces that come up when I'm seeing them come in. So true, I think we absolutely don't, uh, we often discount our SPED students, that's absolutely true. And there could be so many famous people in those classes, absolutely. I think he made a very good point about that. I know one thing that particularly came up for me and typically does um, is when he said we're preparing our children for a world that uh, we don't even know, we don't even know about yet. So, you know, they're prepared to be in a world that, and we're preparing them with standards and for skills that we're not quite sure whether they will or they won't need. I agree, creativity is so much more important than literacy and math. Um, I think that we don't often think about the fact that we are, as he said, um, that we need to stop educating our children out of creativity. Yep. Educating the whole child, it's true. Are we really thinking about the whole child? Or are we thinking about specific academic standards? I agree, Donna, it's true. The education system often does feel like it's stifling creativity and how can we push back against that as educators? Yep. Gwen, I agree, it is really sad to think about the fact that children really are born so artistic and we kind of teach them to grow out of it because of what's valued in the education system. All of these are, all of these are so spot on. And the reason I wanted us to watch this video before we kind of got into the nuts and bolts of what Quest is, is because this is really at the heart of it. You're gonna see units that are much more focused on the idea of self-exploration um, then focus necessarily 100% on the academic standards. It's allowing children to think creatively, as Sean's kind of saying, um, and be right, rather than accepting whatever the guidelines are. Like the point of you teaching this course is really to push students in their exploration of self, figuring out not only who they are, but you know what they wanna to contribute to the world and what they feel like the world owes them to learn. Um, and then also them understanding the multitude of careers that are out there beyond just the path to college. That is one path and that's a great path and that's value, but there's also a lot of other <clears throat> mid-level jobs where they can make even more money than if they went to college um, and that might be better aligned to their passions. So really keep those two things in mind. Um, Definitely feel free to show classes this video. I've shown it across the world and I think every educator I've met agrees with this to some level. Um, 
Oh, that's so interesting about the di divergent thinking in the paperclip study. Yep, that is so true. Please definitely read Michael's response in the chat box if you haven't. I think that when we think about this, we just have to really go in with the mindset of this course that we are doing something that a lot of other classes, not necessarily that they don't want to do, that they might not think they have the time to do because as somebody said earlier, testing is just so high now. So for a lot of students, this class could be a game changer for them in high school because they might not get another touch point like this. So before we fully get started, I do want to thank you for teaching this course um, because it really, for students, I've seen students who have taken this course who it is really like adjusted their mindset about being in high school. So I do want to thank you now for, you know, the work that you're going to put in teaching this course. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. This is kind of just taking you through what we're doing, some of what we've already done, um, but we're kind of just gonna ground through what the shifts are in the career sector. These are, these are very important knowledge bases for you all to know that there are some very key facts about our economy in particular that make Quest so important and so relevant right now. Um, the shifting career sectors being one that we'll talk about. I definitely want you all to have a solid grounding of how the quest came, uh, how quest came to be, and that it was created by all teachers um, or people who are like the head of CTE departments and districts. So people who are on the ground with kids every day, um, understanding the conceptual frameworks that we'll be using. We're going to do an overview of the units and the projects because I really want you all to have an understanding of what the different units look like, and then. If you haven't taken um, any time doing project based learning before what the projects look like and what that is. Um, we're going to actually be going into the materials folder so that you have an understanding of how to read the different guides. There are several of them. So when to use the unit guide, um, the different teacher preparation points so you feel solid about what you're looking at, and then just some key pieces of implementing project based learning. So if everybody can take a second and just make sure that they can access the materials folder, there's two places you can get it. The link that Ted has up. Um, and I think it looks like he's gonna click on it, which is great. And then it's also available on the DOE website at this point. So if you could just make sure you can pull it up, you should see this inside of it. We will be actively using it in about 30 minutes. So just please make sure you have it up on your computer and minimize it so that you can actively engage with it. So if you could just type, yes, I have it, or I've got it, London is cool. If not, please put a little message up so that Ted can privately message you so we can figure out why you're not able to access the materials. But I do want to make sure everybody can access them. So I'm going to give us about two minutes to make sure that you can pull it up and then we'll head to the next slide. So once it's up, just message, you know, yes, or I've got it. I have it. Thank you, Heather. So it looks like I need about 16 more messages saying y'all got it. And Ted's also showing you how to get it on the DOE website. And Ted is even putting the link. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. I see about four of us now look like we've got it. And definitely make a point to save this on your desktop because it's gonna be, or a star it, whichever way you would like to save it. Just cause this is gonna, you know, this is basically your built-in curriculum for the year. Brenda's saying she's got it. Great. For about 12 more people to make sure they have it. Great. Thank you, Sean. Ted, would you do me a favor and then just privately message um, B. David, because he was saying he doesn't have it. Rosemary, I see you, awesome. Angela, looks like you got it, awesome. Thank you, Ted. 
I'm gonna have Ted click to the next slide just for sake of time, because at this point I know over half of us had it. Um, oh, Monique, you can use that link that Ted put up there and you can access it because now it's on the DOE website. So if you just scroll up a little bit, Ted put it up there so you can just click on it. Donna, same thing. If you look right above Brenda's comment, Ted put um, the link to it. So if you just click on it, it should take you right to the DOE website. And then Ted, if you'll just um, just privately message Monique and then B. David and Donna, just to make sure that they can get it while I'm kind of going through this next piece, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, so we're gonna go through now because I know over half of you have it and it seems like everybody else, Ted's getting to them. If you don't, um, the we're gonna go through the why and the how. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about why Quest was created how it was created, and then we're gonna go into the materials. So Ted, if you'll go to the next slide. So if you can just type into the chat for me quickly, what are some of the jobs and careers that you personally think would be in demand in the next five to 25 years? So you can type anything that comes to mind. In the next five to 25 years, what do you think will be some of the high demand jobs? Absolutely, Michael, cybersecurity, huge. Which relates directly to technology. <laughs> Graphic design, absolutely, Monique. Again, going back directly to technology, medical engineering, tech support, programming, right? I love that you brought up health, Rosemary. We're gonna get into that in just a little bit, right? Tech support. So I'm seeing you all hit on two of the biggest ones, um, the health field as well as the tech field. Absolutely, thank you for engaging in that quickly with me, um, which is absolutely true. You're gonna see that right now, what we're seeing in the world is that the world is changing. I think we all can say that solidly, that the world has changed greatly in the last 10 years and even more so from the last 20 years. Um, you know, there are certain things that exist now that people use every day, Instagram, Facebook being some of them that did not exist 20 years ago and now have such a huge impact on our society. So when we look at technology, automation, globalization, these are some things that are hugely changing the world around us and creating dynamic shifts, which is therefore creating dynamic shifts in jobs that are necessary as well as job skills. So. If you look at that second bullet, where it talks about 1.4 million US jobs are expected to be lost in the next eight years due to advancements in technology. I know when I first read this fact, I wasn't surprised, but I was taken aback. When we think about the fact that there's 1.4 million jobs that exist today that in eight years won't be here. So where are those 1.4 million people going to work? And thinking about the fact that those 1.4 million people might not have the task skill set for what is therefore then needed um, in a world that's changing rapidly with technology and automation. The other thing to think about is as we have more technology, we also have more globalization. Um, we are definitely a much more global world than we used to be, and that requires changes for this future generation. When we think about the fact that there are a lot of jobs now that you can be anywhere in the world and work that job. When you think about when you call in to different um, tech support, as I'm seeing on here, a lot of those tech supports do not, they're not in America. They're somewhere else because now you can do that because we're in a much more global economy. So thinking about that, are we really preparing our children to be in a very different world that could look very differently um, in the 20 years from now? Ted, next slide. Thank you. This slide, I want to make sure you also have at least one fact that stands out to you when you think about why this course also exists. So two things I know that rapidly stand out to me and have is that last bullet point that attaining a good job um, in the, and having the demand skills is so important. So thinking about the fact that you can have very, very good jobs, very satisfying jobs that perhaps don't require a four-year degree. They might require credentials or a two-year degree, but we don't often teach our children that. So letting them know that they genuinely do have options. I thought it was very interesting that 
in Louisiana in particular in 2015, that 57% of the middle skill jobs, we only had 46% of people who were trained to do them. So it's not that there are not jobs that exist, it's that we don't always have people that are trained to do them. And oftentimes that's because our children don't know they have options. So thinking about the fact that um, mid-level jobs are out there, but a lot of our students don't either know they exist or have the credentialing to do them. So thinking through when you're talking about Quest, this is one of the reasons Quest exists, to give students not only the aspect of self-exploration, but to give them the knowledge and understanding that there is an entire different world of jobs out there that we should also be um, opening them up to. Ted, you can head to the next slide. So when we also think about this idea, this is, um, I mean, this is what we've pretty much been talking about the whole time, is that just the fact that it can be college and career. It doesn't just have to be this idea of you have to be college ready. And what does it mean to just be college bound? Um, we are definitely preparing our children for a world that is not only college centered, but also career centered. So the idea of college for all swung the pendulum a very different way. And then left out a lot of this idea of like career and technical education. So how do we kind of level level that playing field, swing that pendulum back to the middle so that our children are exposed to all options? We can head to the next slide, Ted. So one thing we're gonna talk about a lot is rethinking this idea of college and career readiness. So making sure that our children are genuinely developing all the 21st century skills and that they're able to explore the, and, explore various industries and also successfully navigate high school and have that level of creativity and self-introduction. You can head to the next slide. This you can kind of, I don't, I'm not going to read the slide for you, but I think one of the biggest pieces to think about is that we're going to be talking a lot about what the cross-sector employable, employability skills and competencies are because we want to make sure that our children are graduating in a place where they are employable. Um, and these are things we mentioned earlier. Are we ensuring that we're teaching them critical thinking? Are we ensuring that we're teaching them communication, collaboration, professionalism, and responsibility? Those are going to be things we talk about in all of the units that we go through, because those were things that as we put together Quest, that um, the different sectors, the different employment sectors were saying, they're not seeing consistently in our children that we're graduating. So how are we specifically thinking about teaching them those? We can head to the next slide. So these are, and actually you all hit them right on the head. Um, you definitely talked about information technology being one of the fastest growing fields. You definitely talked about healthcare being one of the biggest growing fields. And then the other one that we did miss is advanced manufacturing. Advanced manufacturing is the other one, including chemical, petrochemical. Those are the three biggest um, and the largest percent growing fields in Louisiana, according to the Louisiana Workforce Commission. So, you know, we've seen that healthcare is going to increase by 15% from 2016 to 2026, manufacturing by 15% over the same time period, and IT will increase 18%. So, these are going to be the three biggest growing fields in Louisiana um, by 2026. So, when we think of what are we directly preparing our children for in terms of workforce, those are the three biggest ones. Ted, you can head to the next one. So it's going back to these three big pieces. So it's, and when anybody asks, you know, what are you preparing your students for in Quest? We want to teach them about themselves. We want to teach them about that they have options. And we want to teach them about the different career fields. And then we want to make sure that they have these soft skills, these 21st century skills to be ready to go out and be productive citizens into the workforce. Um, and that they have the skills by the time they graduate high school. Next one. So one thing that we talked a lot about is what is the difference between journeys and quest. Um, Ted, you can actually put the whole thing up for this one. Um, there are a lot of people who were in involved in this curriculum who taught journeys. And so this is just kind of the quick and dirty of it about what was the difference in the two. Um, I think what we saw from teachers who were in our pilot group who taught Quest, one thing they said was that Quest, what they appreciated was it had this authentic project-based learning experience and gave, Quest is going to give you some very specific materials. 
Journeys didn't have as much of a specific curriculum and Quest really does. So you're not necessarily picking and choosing from things. Um, Quest is at a much higher level. So you're gonna see a much deeper engagement from students. It's le much less worksheet based. I mean, you have a much deeper level of critical thinking, communication, all of those skills that we talked about. And it has a much deeper piece where students are not just introduced to employability skills, but they're really like deeply engaging in them in an authentic way. So as you go through, I definitely want you to make sure you understand that Quest is very different from Journeys. It's not, you couldn't, you can't teach Quest using Journeys materials. That, that I think is one of the biggest pieces that we've talked to anytime we talk to um, teachers about this course is that you almost have to think of it as completely different course. It's not like the new Journeys, it's not Journeys 2.0, um, which I know we get a lot of new uh, curriculums often, we get a lot of new courses often, but Quest is very much its own thing. I think you're gonna really like it when you start to dig through the materials with me and see it, but just really understanding that it's its own thing. Ted? Thank you. So how we got here, um, you'll see kind of the different industry partners that we worked with, but it was a group of educators from across Louisiana, from the majority of parishes. You have the current um, Spencer Kipner, who's the current uh, state teacher of the year, was involved. You had people um, like Martha, who has been the head of like EBR's CTE program for a very long time. Um, just people who have been deeply immersed in this work of CTE, whether at the classroom level, the district level, um, but who see students and working with them in this way and engage in this way. So the teachers and students who engaged in this in the pilot were also similarly teachers who had taught, typically who had taught journeys before and then had moved to Quest. Um, and so we were able to really see firsthand what the materials were like engaging with the students and then also make revisions based on that. So getting the feedback from teachers who were teaching it as a pilot and the students who were learning it, and then also getting feedback from industry partners who would be employing students post-graduation. So this course is very much a collaboration of educators and industry and students um, to really have the strongest impact on learning possible. Ted, you can do it the next slide. So these are just some quotes from the pilot. Um, you definitely have a much deeper, part of outside of the box thinking. Um, and then I love what they said about you learn a lot about themselves and how to work with others. That's a big piece. You're gonna see that in almost every piece of the pilot um, that you're really learning not only how you operate as an individual, but how you can collaborate because that collaboration piece was huge in every industry that we see. We can go to the next one. Oh, I, I agree. Um, that piece about that we really tried to give you all resources, that's a huge one. I think that the goal is for you all to be able to go in and teach, not to be pulling materials all the time, but for you to be able to go in and really just teach this and also have additional resources if you want to go deeper into it with your students. So this next piece, we're going to be developing an understanding of what Quest actually is. This should be something that <laughs> you and your students know. So we're focusing on the 21st century skills. We went over that part. We're navigating through their different career sectors. We talked about that. Your students should have an understanding of what the employability landscape in Louisiana does look like. And as an educator, we need to make sure you all understand what high quality project-based learning is. That's something we're gonna spend a lot of time on at the end. And then how we can figure out um, how to ensure people have the right resources they need and the right training on them so that we make sure the course is being implemented with fidelity. One complaint that we got often about journeys was that it looks so different depending on what teacher is teaching it. The goal would be for us all to have the resources. So whether I'm learning Quest in New Orleans or Shreveport, I'm still getting the same exposure so that students across the state have the same level of self-exploration as well as the same level to career readiness. We can head to the next slide. So you can take a picture of this. You can make sure you have this on a wall somewhere. These are the course competencies. These are definitely the pieces that you need to make sure you spend time going over with your students. Um, they're kind of your, did you hit this in the different units? So, apply, excuse me, applied knowledge, we all understand that one. That's the academic piece, that's the critical thinking. 
when we get into the second one, the relational skills, that's when we're talking about the interpersonal skills. That's when we're talking about the communication, the teamwork, the collaboration. That's, are we hitting that on the head as we're going through making the groups in our classes, doing the community contracts, things like that. The personal qualities, are we really teaching our students professionalism? Are we teaching them self-worth? Are we teaching them discipline? Are we teaching them personal growth? Are we teaching them how to work independently? So judging their projects and the work that they're doing on that. Those executive skills, we're gonna have a unit where we teach them about technology, about systems, um, about resource management. So are we working with them through those? We're gonna be grading them on those pieces. The career navigation skills, obviously that's a huge highlight onto this course. Definitely focusing on recognizing those cross-sector transferable skills um, and how to understand what utilizing those post-secondary search application and financing resources are. And also understanding that networking piece about the different job and career sectors and ongoing skill development. So are we taking them through those? Um, and then obviously we have a section on financial literacy. I think as somebody said earlier, it's just so important and we don't necessarily spend as much time on it as we should. And then this idea of what as students do, you know, students owe the world as a citizen of it. So are we really, we're gonna have a whole section, I believe it's unit five, that focuses specifically on what does that sort of uh, civic engagement look like in terms of not only what are the students gonna show the world, but what do the students owe the world? So let's head to the next one. So please make sure those you've written down somewhere they are in the units, but that's a big piece. So this is actually one of my favorite slides coming up, this one right here. This is another one where if you wanna take a screenshot, take a picture of it. This is, I love the progression of the units. I think it's really important to be able to see what that looks like. So the units build upon one another. What we've gotten a question about before is, is it okay to skip around? Sometimes, you know, as a teacher, we think maybe I wanna teach the digital citizenship before I teach effective teams. But this is one of those curriculums where the goal is to teach it in order. The reason the goal is to teach it in order is because there are certain activities that build to the next one. So if I don't do effective teams, then when I'm talking about the team contracts later in unit five, my students won't have had an experience with that before, so they'll be confused about what it is. So the, the units are meant to be taught in a specific sequence for that very reason. Um, think about them in chunks. The first two units, um, the first two, three units are about knowing self and then the self-relation. And then we head into the units on leading responsibility. So you're gonna see unit three, they're really becoming innovative with creating a food truck. There's digital citizenship. And then unit five, we talk about that civic engagement piece about superheroes in our community. And then planning for the future is when we head into that piece about money management, navigating career paths, and then really making a plan. So please make sure as you look through these, you think, what is it gonna look like to really teach these in the sequence that they're laid out in? Ted, you can head to the next one. This is my other favorite slide, which I would definitely suggest taking a picture of or doing a screenshot of as well. This shows you the unit performance tasks. So when your principal is asking you, you know, how are you grading your different students, this is definitely one of the grading metrics that you will use is through the unit performance tasks. So you'll see every unit has at least two. Some of them have up to four. Well, what you'll see in all of these is that they are very project-based learning centered. Um, they often do require a great level of um, collaboration. A point to highlight is that one of the sections will have your um, students working on their IGP. So I would definitely make a little note that when you get to the navigating my career path that you get with your school's guidance counselor to think through how they want that to specifically roll out. Um, also looking through the how I learn and how I lead, that's when we're really talking about that idea of self, that idea of self, like what is my leadership style? What does that look like for me as a learner? Section two or unit two is when we're really thinking about teams. That's when that team contract piece really comes in. We're also asking our students to look at the idea of like what an RFP is. That unit three is when we're thinking, having them think outside the box and that's that creativity piece. And that's when we're having them design a food truck. That's a really great unit that we'll go into a little bit more later. The unit four, we're talking about that cyber citizen piece. Some people noted when I've done this training before that they have something like this at their school, that their school really talks about the idea of cyberbullying, which is I think so important in this day and age. 
page. Just let your school know this is adding to that. It's not taking away from it. It's just giving them another dose of what that looks like. So the idea of like navigating the net, what your digital identity is, um, oftentimes students don't get that piece, especially as freshmen coming in. So making sure we highlight those. The superheroes in your community project, those have a lot of different pieces to it. And I think the big piece here is like the idea of what does it mean to be an active citizen in your community. Then we go into the idea specifically, as somebody said earlier, about financial literacy. It's a more of a taste because it's a unit. I know a lot of us teach um, courses specifically on financial literacy in high school. So this kind of allows them to think through what does budgeting really look like and how does budgeting uh, work when I'm thinking of specific goals in mind. So a lot of students don't get that until ninth grade. That's this intro to this. By the time we get to the Navigating My Career Paths unit, we've done a lot of self-exploration. So giving them a chance to really explore what, what might I be interested in? What job could be something that really blends my passions and really allows me to think through what my purpose is? And then the idea of like, let's actually do some student success planning because at that point, your students will soon be heading to sophomore year. So what do they need to get out of the rest of high school? So when you're going through the different unit performance tasks, definitely read through them carefully, but think about the progression of thought that goes into those. We can head to the next one. We actually talked through this one. So Ted, you can head to the next one. So now we're gonna go into actually reading and digesting the units. So <clears throat> you all can actually pull up the units now. So wherever your units are, if you have them on another side of your computer, thanks Ted for putting the link back up for us. I want us to be able to walk through the different things that you'll be using. So you have a unit plan, you're gonna have your teacher guide, your student resources that has a performance task in it, and your rubrics. Thank you, Ted. So we're actually gonna walk through these together right now. So if you'll open up your unit one unit plan, we're kind of gonna take a look at that. So I'm gonna give you all about 10, no, we're gonna do them one by one actually. So I'm gonna give you all about three minutes. Look through this unit one guide. I want you to just take some time and look through the unit guide itself. And make sure that as you're going through the unit plan, you're really looking through this idea that's laid out of stages. We talk a lot about stages in the unit, stage one, stage two, stage three. Stage one being like the desired results, stage two being the assessment, and stage three being the actual learning plan. So Ted, if you'll go back up to the top for me, I'm just gonna point out a few key things in the unit plan, <clears throat> and then we're gonna go take a look at the teacher guide. So think of your unit plan the same way you think of any other one. Um, it has obviously the title of the unit at the top and then the suggested timeline. As you're thinking about long-term planning, make sure you click open every one of the units and look at how many days it has suggested for each unit. We understand that for some people, these are gonna take longer because you might only have 45 minute classes, which once students come in and out translates to about 35 minute classes. And for some people, they might have 90 minute classes, so they might get through these faster. So when you go down, you'll see like the different goals, which really are applying to those competencies that we talked about later. This particular unit in unit one looks at the first four competencies. You can obviously read through them but that's how you find out like, what am I, what is my goal of this particular unit? And then we also made sure to apply it to other standards in case you, <clears throat> you know, your school system is also looking for how they connect to perhaps the different 
Louisiana standards in English or math or anything like that. So you'll see which ones this unit overlaps with. In this case, you'll see some standards from the speaking and listening standards of eighth grade English, as well as the speaking listening standards of ninth and 10th grade English. So making sure that if you need to write an objective on the board that also um, aligns with the English language arts that you can have that resource as well. Ted, if you'll scroll down for me. The second stage, like I was saying, is the assessment. So figuring out like what is it that I'm grading my students on, we gave you a variety of options. So this particular unit, you have two performance tasks. One is your personal brand and vision board, which we'll go into what that actually looks like later when we're going through the other pieces. And the second is your student success plan. So those would be considered your two big projects at the end of the unit. Those could be the two big grades that you're giving. But then when you look at the right, there's a variety of other grades that can be given and another like informal and formal assessments. Obviously class discussion is one, but there's, there's some more concrete pieces like the self-awareness assessment that you'll see soon when we go through the lessons. You'll see different exit tickets at the end of the lessons, different questions and responses that you can use to grade. This particular one, you could give an assignment where it talks about the uh, personal career and goal statements. You can use that as a smaller grade. And then there's also reflection paragraphs. So one question we get asked a lot is because it's so project-based learning centered, are there going to be enough grades? Believe me, there are more than enough grades in each of the units for you to use. Um, I actually think there's probably more than you're gonna be able to use. So making sure before you start each unit that you decide which of these activities are gonna be for a grade and which ones of them are just gonna be centered on learning. But that's always gonna be at the stage two assessment piece. Ted, you can scroll down for me, please. This is your learning plan. This is your daily outline. So we talked about this unit is 10 days. We specifically lay out for you about how many days each should take and what each is about. So you'll see that we start with this idea of um, lesson one, talking about what strengths and values students have. And then you can see the overview of that plan for the day. So this kind of gives you that bird's eye view of what exactly is this unit accomplishing each day and how long should it take for each of those days, culminating this particular unit in the student success plan. So this is five lessons done in 10 days. You'll see some of them are obviously over two instead of one. So this is something if I were um, teaching this course right now, I would print out and just have on my desk for each of the units. Obviously you can print out the whole thing, but this is nice to just have a glance at to say, am I accomplishing what this unit is hoping for me to accomplish? Ted, can you please scroll? You'll, you'll see next in here that the suggested text and resources are always right after the stage three learning plan easy to click on as you're going through. Just click, click, click. Let me open these. Let me make sure I can access them all easily. Let me print if I need to. Um, and also under that are your academic vocabulary. So if you're somebody who likes to use a word wall, likes to have students do a vocabulary learn page, anything like that, you'll always see that right under stage three. Um, Ted, you can head down for me again, please. Um, this piece is just about what the checkpoints are and the materials that you'll need for each day. So you'll see kind of like each learning plan goes a little bit more in depth here. So when you talk about, it goes into um, the personal brand and vision, it gives you the deeper synopsis, it gives you what the different readiness competencies are and the different essential questions. So these would be the questions you would write on your board for that lesson. So when we're starting on the personal brand, really having students think through, for example, what are my values and career aspirations? Great way to start your lesson with that, because that's the really essential question that we're asking that day. If you'll scroll, please. And then, like I said, you kind of see this go deeper into that day is like every single PowerPoint, every single rubric, um, every single article they read. I mean, really, you genuinely do not have to look up anything for these. It's really all laid out for you with a variety of suggestions, right? So when you're looking at the reading for the vision boards, you do not have to do all of those. But this gives you a variety of different ones that you can use. So you know your classes, obviously, much better than we do. So once you click through those, you would know that the three powerful benefits of creating a vision board might work better, you know, in Monique's class, whereas if we're in 
Heather's class, she might have looked through these and think that, you know, the reason vision boards work and how to make one might work better when she's showing her students vision boards. So make sure that you read through those and figure out what works for you. All of them are aligned, um, but it's just what works better for your class. Same thing when you're talking about the elevator pitch articles. Those two articles definitely articulate the same point but one might work better for your class of students than the other, or you might split your students into groups. One reads one, one reads the other. The point is for you to have enough resources that are aligned, but also can align to the personality of you as a teacher and of your students. Um, Ted, you can head down. Those are just the formative checkpoints. And this goes again, and this continues to kind of go through what we just did. So every day has that more detailed plan. So when you're going through the unit plans, just making sure you understand exactly what each lesson is asking for. And so rather than having to create lessons, you're more digesting them, digesting them and figuring out what pieces work for you. So that's the unit plan. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. I know that I'm going through it pretty quickly, but I wanna make sure that we get through everything um, in the assigned time. Ted, if you'll pull up the teacher guide just quickly for me. So when you're looking at the teacher guide, this is almost like you can read this before the unit guide. This is very specifically for you. It talks about what the students will be able to know. Ted, you can kind of scroll down it. You'll see that there's some like academic vocabulary that goes a little bit deeper just for your students to be able to know. Same thing as before, if you wanna put the vocabulary up, great, but it's just do your children know these words so you can talk through them. And then we also give you some different ways that you as a teacher can teach vocab, whether it's the KWL chart or the word wall. Many teachers have their own way of teaching vocabulary. These are just some suggestions. If you wanted some further suggestions on how to make sure you're getting across those 15 words in unit one that the students do need to know. And then we also added some different um, links to further understand like strong methods for teaching vocabulary. This one is like that idea again of like, I'm doing that study and preparing for the unit. So you'll see that we really take you through the different activities, what you'll need for them, what they look like. So after you kind of go through the unit plan and understand what this unit looks like, this is kind of that nitty gritty about what do I need to do as the teacher to make sure I have the things I need. For example, this one calls for a paper plate icebreaker activity. So it would be good to go through the teacher resource guide if your principal gives you a certain budget for your class to be able to see what are some things that I need for my course to be able to teach it effectively or to put on your syllabus for your students to bring. So Ted, you can kind of keep scrolling down so it shows you what those are. It shows you the personality assessment and how you get to the variety of those. So you can pick which one you wanna use and what the outcomes for those are. So we don't have to scroll through the whole thing for sake of time, but think about this as like your prep book. So I've gone through the unit plan. This is exactly what this looks like, my overview of it. My teacher resource guide is what are all the things I need to decide upon and kind of get ready to make sure I'm teaching it effectively. So that I think of that more as my checklist. So my unit resource guide gives me the big picture overview. My teacher resource guide gives me the checklist to be able to effectively teach it. And then uh, Ted, can you open for me the student resources? <clears throat> These are your student materials. So if you kind of scroll down this, you'll be able to see exactly like what you need to tell your students that they're going to be doing. And this one also, I believe, can you scroll down for me again, Ted, to the bottom of this one? This kind of takes, oh, thank you. This kind of takes you through exactly like for your students, for your personal brand. And, oh, this is his performance task one. So actually, will you go back up to the top for me? So this is actually one of the things you're gonna be able to give your students so that they understand what they're being graded on for this particular performance task. So there's two in this unit, and this is one of the big ones. So they know that like at the end of this, they're creating a vision board. And then the other one is they're creating their student success plan. So you can give this to them at the beginning of the unit so that they know that what they're actually getting graded on at the end of it or you can give it to them right before the actual project, but the goal is that they understand that this is what you're being graded on. It's easy to just print out and hand to them. And then, um, Ted, will you go to 
the other the other performance task on this one. Performance task two. Thank you. Same thing with this one. I just wanted you all to be able to see both of them for this unit. And then she'll scroll down for me, Ted. Thank you. Yeah, you can just keep scrolling down for me. You'll see it goes, you'll see it goes literally as in depth as to tell the students exactly what sort of reflection questions that they're going to be writing on. So your students really understanding you'll need the student success plan and you'll need the rubric. So Ted, if you'll go to the teacher rubric, it's really important for us that students know what they're being graded on, right? So not just the idea of here's the project, we want you to complete it, but here's the actual rubric. Um, yeah, thank you for flipping it for me. Thanks. Almost there. <laughs> Thank you. So for all of the performance tasks, you'll see this. So for the student success plan, it goes as in depth to say, did you include a career goal? Yes or no? If it's no, we're going to lose some points off the project. If it's yes, great, you did what you're supposed to do. Looking through, if you go down to see the students like meets expectations and consistently does not meet in comments, you're actually able to write in here and check off did your students meet the expectations of the project in a very clear, concise way that makes sense to high schoolers? So it doesn't feel like it's something that's so subjective about, you know, I decided to give you a C versus a B because of this or an A versus a B because of this. It's yes, you did do this part or no, you didn't. And yes, you met all the expectations or you met some but not others. Just to make it clear for them about exactly what we're hoping for them to gain from each project and whether or not they met the expectations. So this would be the, um, the rubrics are another thing to make sure you're giving the students so they understand exactly what they're being graded on. And then Ted, we can, those we can close out of. Do people have questions about those? As you're looking through them, you'll see all the parts we talked about for every single unit. Does anybody have questions about these, about how you would utilize one versus the other or why you would use one versus the other? I'm not seeing anything in the chat yet. So Ted, you can head to the next one, which um, you can actually keep going because I went through all of these. That was the unit plan we talked about. That was kind of the teacher guide, which is your daily breakdown with the timing and the links. The student resource, which has the performance task that we talked about. The teacher rubric that lets you know if they met or did not meet expectations. So questions about any of those. All right, then we can head into the next slide. We're actually going to be digging into each of the units. So this is, I'm trying to give you the, a pretty high level overview about exactly what each unit is and what each unit is going to require. So I would definitely make sure to take some jot down notes on each of these. Um, you're gonna obviously have time to go through them later in the resources, but I wanna make sure if people have questions that I'm giving you a chance to ask. All right, Ted, you can go to the next one. Thank you, Angela. Okay, unit one. Unit one is how I learn, how I lead. So this is the, it's one of the biggest focuses on self. So when you're thinking about this unit, really think about how am I getting my student to know themselves. We know what it means to think of an auditory visual or a kinesthetic learner, a lot of our students haven't heard those words before, at least haven't thought about them based on themselves. We want them to think about them based on themselves. They're gonna have a part in this unit where they understand that it's just as important to be the first follower in a movement as it is to be the leader in a unit. So them understanding who am I in that way. In this unit, we want them to be able to really come up with a personal goal for themselves and a career goal and be able to articulate those in a way that's concise, um, has conviction behind it, and has pieces to back it up. And then we also want the students to be able to have an understanding of what are things that they have visions for themselves. So really creating what are things that are important to you as an individual. So I really think of this unit as what is the, who am I? This is very much the who am I unit and how do I contribute? 
So when you think of this piece, again, it's the vision board and it's the student success plan. Those are the two big pieces they come away with, but creating that personal and career goal are also equally as important. Ted, you can head to the next one. This is the unit where we think about that collaboration that we so much talked about when we were talking to the different, um, the different uh, employers that they are so focused on students learning how to collaborate with each other. So this unit is really students learning about how to become effective teams. Not just that collaboration is important, but how do I effectively collaborate? So this unit also is going to be focused on the manufacturing sector. So them learning what advanced manufacturing is. Excuse me. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, they're going to have to understand the RFP process. And so for us, if that's not something that we typically are used to, I definitely found that many teachers told me they wanted to make sure to kind of study this unit a little bit more because there were some terms in it that they weren't necessarily used to as well. Students get to develop a website in this unit. So again, if you're not somebody who's as website savvy, I would definitely make sure I'm reviewing the resources in this unit because this unit has a little bit, a little bit more skill heavy and things that perhaps we don't typically use every day. So understanding how to support them in some of those. And then we'll also make sure we understand how to take students through the team contracts that we'll talk about a little bit later under project based learning. Ted, you can go to the next one. Unit three, if you're coming to the um, September session, we'll actually go through unit three, which is honestly, I think one of everybody's favorite units. The students will get to actually design a food truck. And this is where wanting them to think about what does it mean to be innovative? What does it mean to create a business plan? Um, <clears throat> and we're having students really work together in these teams and in these groups in a way that we're utilizing what they learned in unit two. So unit two was how to create effective teams. And so now in unit three is let's use these teams to work in a very creative way to create something, to innovate something. So they learn in this unit how to think in ways where they're not just figuring out what, what is in front of me, but what could the future look like? So for them, I think this is what we talked about earlier, the idea of really promoting creativity. This is right up that, the, this unit's alley. A lot of kids love unit three. We can head to the next one. This is that one we talked about, about the cyber citizen piece. I mean, I just, if you've never used EverFi, it's a great tool. I would make yourself a little note right now that tomorrow or the next day to just create yourself an EverFi account because you will absolutely need it for this unit. EverFi has presentations already up about being cyber citizens. And it's a really great way to make sure that kids get some hands-on experience with that. You will be using the computers or computer lab a lot in this unit. So if you're somebody who does not, um, it's not one-to-one -one in your school, make sure you look through when you'll get to unit four and see that you're ensuring you're reserving a computer lab because otherwise it will be hard to carry out this unit if you don't have access to computers. The other point about this unit is to make sure there's um, common sense media. That's another thing I want to make sure you look up the same with EverFi so you get a strong understanding of how to navigate it. Two very great, great resources, but being familiar with them the same way we talked about in unit um, two, being familiar with um, the advanced manufacturing piece. Just if it's something you're not used to seeing every day, just making sure you give yourself a little bit of time to play around in there. Ted, you can head to unit five. Oh my gosh, so true. Please make sure you get all these links unblocked. We definitely had teachers who noted that that piece could be challenging. So just spending some time going through and making sure your schools whitelist all these links if you don't have open access to the internet, which most schools do not. Unit five is another unit we found that people really loved. It's that idea of civic engagement. So looking through these, you're, you get to really have the students interact with the community. So whether that be the school community or the community at large. Oh, thank you, Ted. There is a list in the admin materials folder so that you don't have to go around clicking all of them. I actually didn't know you all had created that. That's awesome. That's hugely helpful because then you can just forward that list to whoever does IT for your district. So make yourself a little note along with getting familiar with EverFi and getting familiar with Common Sense to make sure you just send your IT director that list so you don't run into troubles. This unit we really wanna teach in unit five, kids the idea of what it means to be altruistic. 
So we often don't talk to children enough about what it means to give back, what it means to care for others, what it means to contribute to your community. So we actually want students to be able to do some job shadowing of what, what are called the helping professions. So professions where kids are actually really focused on contributing because we want them to see is this something <clears throat> that you could be interested in as a long-term job. So thinking about the fact that when we're thinking about unit three with the food trucks, we're thinking about students who become entrepreneurs. This is really for students who could think through, maybe I want a helping profession. Maybe I want to eventually be a teacher. Maybe I want to eventually be a nurse. What are things that I would do that could work towards giving back and getting them a chance to think through those. So really thinking about the idea of what does service mean. <clears throat> the biggest thing I want people to think about for this is when we're talking about the, um, the community service project that students do, it doesn't have to be hugely outside of your school community. It can be something as simple as like your students doing like a school cleanup day or planning a community garden or it could be something much bigger. The point is for them to come up with a project that they see is important for the community that you are working with. And it could be the school community, it could be a larger community. That's something to start thinking about now because it's really, you know, I know that it can be challenging if you're teaching, you know, over a thousand students to have them all at different times doing a project in the school. So really thinking through what's feasible for you, but also impactful for your students. Also, there's a portion of this where your students are interviewing people that do helping professions. So thinking about the timeline for what that looks like, and you may be having people who you kind of have ready as suggestions for students who they can interview. Ted, you can head to the next one. Unit six is pretty self-explanatory. This is that managing your money piece that is so important. Um, but making sure um, you actually review, same as the others, what the online toolkit looks like in there so that you can make sure students have a strong understanding of what the different website links they'll need. But unit six is, that's your money unit. You can head to the next one. This is the unit where they'll be going through their IGPs. So really making sure you get in touch with your guidance counselors. This is that unit where your guidance counselors, they might have already rolled out IGPs already. A lot of guidance counselors are starting, they do that in eighth grade. So making sure you either have a copy of your students' IGPs that should be in their QM folders or talking to your counselor and seeing if your counselor actually wants to come in during this unit to work with the students alongside you. The other piece about this is making sure that your students understand that you'll be helping them with a cover letter and resume and that can be challenging. So them understanding what that looks like, but letting them know they'll definitely need that later as they progress to sophomore, senior, and junior year. And so you're giving them a foundation with that already. This one is the fact that we want them to be able to explore their interests and then link their interests to a pathway. And then again, that big piece in this unit about understanding what middle skill jobs are um, with the resources that are given. Ted, you can hit the next one. And this last unit, this is really where we're getting to that final kind of like planning ahead. So what are the last things that you'll need to make sure students know to be able to take them to that next point? So you're going to be coordinating um, a parent career night that can come in there. Students will actually be going back to their student success plans and vision boards and updating them. So you look at what their thoughts were in the beginning. And then after you really help them through this learning journey, what they're kind of adding then thereafter. Students being able to actually um, familiarize themselves with like the ACT profile, looking at different post-secondary tours. You know, you can have different folks come in at that point to do conversations on what different fields look like. The point is for them to come out of this unit with now, I've been given all of this knowledge about different career paths. I've had a chance to reflect on myself. I've worked on my communication and collaboration skills. Now what's my plan? as I head into 10th, 11th, and 12th grade to ensure that I'm meeting a strong level of success um, and making sure that I'm using all the tools that I've been given throughout the actual units. Ted, you can head to the next one. So this is just, I think that if you all look at these four questions, and I'm going to give everybody about two minutes, and I just want you to answer one. You don't have to answer all of them, but pick one question to answer inside the chat.
Any surprises, any concerns? What do you think you'd be excited about? Um, or how you see yourself teaching these? So whichever question jumps out at you, just please take a second and type your answer into the chat box. That's a fair one, Brenda, about the job shadowing piece for eighth graders. I think that's definitely something where it could be something that's done also more inside of the school building. Perhaps like they could shadow the counselor for a day or the counselor could come in and a group could interview the counselor instead of them going out and about in the world. Um, I know that's how some people did it. They asked different teachers if they could um, kind of interview them at the school as well. So just giving them a chance to kind of learn about people's backgrounds, but it doesn't have to be outside. Awesome, I love that you guys are talking about the units having everything built in. Actually, the superheroes unit is one of my favorites as well, personally. Robert, uh, I also was a little bit more challenged by the cyber citizen unit. I think the good piece when you start digging into it is that you'll see it's like everything's kind of laid out in there for you, which is nice. Um, so you don't have to do as much like pre-learning. It's just more making sure you can navigate the website piece, but that one I struggled with. But you'll see like kind of when you get into it, <clears throat> that it's, it has a lot in there for you that's uh, kind of like already pre-done. Thanks to Everfy. Oh, Heather, I'm glad to know you guys did it with interviews at your school as well. That's awesome. I definitely found that that's a lot easier unless you just have a community where you already know, like the chamber or something like that that's willing to help. If you're doing it at your school, you see get a very similar experience, but it's much easier to coordinate. These are great comments. Thank you all. Yes, Nepris is a great, great tool as well. So if you all uh, jot that down as just a little note for yourself, <clears throat> Nepris allows you to connect with, um, if you haven't used it before, people in many different fields. So it becomes an online app where students can actually, you can say, I want to talk to, a uh, well, we're talking about the helping profession. So I want to talk to somebody who is a nurse, for example, and like you can connect with people online to do it that way. So that actually could be another great way to do it virtually. If you found it challenging to do it in the schools or something like that, or in your community, that's another great way to do it is through NetBrace. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh, Michael, that's awesome. I love that it fits in perfectly in that way. That's actually really cool too, that you have the community uh, project for your whole school. That's awesome. I love that. The firewall piece is a very interesting point. If you have issues with your you know, IT or something like that, I mean, that the list is supposed to be for that piece that they should be able to whitelist that whole piece. But Ted, if people are having issues with their district on that IT side, is that something they can reach out to you about? Uh, yes, definitely can reach out. Uh, so today, during a school systems planning call, which is a call that we do with all school system leaders, uh, we did share that the curriculum was live on the LDOE website. Uh, so please reach out to me, like they still won't allow, and then I'll talk to the, uh, you know, to your school system CTE leader to try to get it worked out so we can get access to those sites for you because it's something that you're going to have access to to offer this course, or else you will not be able to offer this course. You all, Ted is incredibly helpful, incredibly responsive. So if you are running into those, like those kind of like bigger systematic issues that you would need to talk to a district person about, I mean, he is very, very helpful. So that is definitely a great resource and he makes himself very available, which I always appreciate. 
Awesome. Thank you all for being so responsive. I am so, I'm genuinely so thrilled to see so many of you excited about so many pieces of the course. I mean, I am, I cannot tell you how pumped I am to see you all teaching this um, because I've seen teachers now with the pilot who are teaching it and teachers who are starting to teach it this year who you're just seeing it make such a dramatic shift for students. So I cannot, I cannot wait to hear, you know, about this from student people who are coming in September to see what the first few months have looked like. And definitely feel free to come with also your questions or pieces you're still working through. So Ted, if you'll head to the last piece. This piece is, so this is the very last section. And this section, we're really focusing on project-based learning. So um, thank you, one, everyone for hanging in there with us. I know it's kind of challenging online and we've been on the computers for about an hour and a half, but hang in there with me for about another 30 minutes um, because this project-based learning piece is really at the core of what we're doing. So some of you might be experts on PBL, which is great. This is going to be a kind of a crash course refresher. If you have never heard of project-based learning before, this is similarly that crash course, but feel free please to type your questions in the chat and let's use it kind of like a, <clears throat> like a question catcher. Um, because I want to make sure that if you have questions on PBL, that we're making sure to answer them. So we're going to start with this idea that if we want students to be problem solvers, we actually have to give them problems to solve, right? So we talk about this 21st century idea. We want children to be critical thinkers. We want them to be problem solvers, those pieces, but then we tell them what to think. So the goal of what we're doing with PBL is we're giving them a problem and then we're allowing them the creativity and the space to be able to actually practice problem solving in a really authentic way. So we are going to watch this short three minute video um, that really explains how PBL can and should develop these 21st century skills that we keep talking about wanting to ensure that students have. So Ted, if you can video, click the video link for me, please. Some students at age 15 have great difficulties translating a problem from one context into the context of another discipline. But this is where creative thinking and innovative thinking comes really from. It's about, you know, connecting the dots. At our best, we leverage the talents from um, people from every background. And instead of being victims of change, we're agents of change. It's estimated that 52% of jobs expect to require cognitive abilities, including creativity, log logical reasoning, problem solving. It's about, you know, curiosity, resilience, uh, adaptability, courage, leadership. Those kinds of dimensions are gaining in importance. So we have CVS in Rhode Island, and they need to find ever more analytical and technical skills. They need more on-the-job training I think actually the character dimension will be at least as important in the lives of people. You know, maybe actually work will play a less, the kind of productive work, a less important role in our future lives and sort of the social life will play a more important role in the, 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 your capacity to engage with people, to work with people who are different from you, to find orientation. All of those things are very important, values of human dignity. At our best, we equip people to have a can-do spirit individually and working together in order to solve problems. The good news is that's our best strength as Americans, and that's just the kind of orientation that 21st century employers are looking for, given the change in the economy. Given the non-routine jobs, given the work in teams that's required, this aspect of our strengths across all of our backgrounds is actually incredibly well suited to the needs of work. We heard a lot from industry. We are sick of kids just learning how to solve problems. We need kids who can identify problems. When you go to the world of work, no one tasks out for you what your work will be every minute of every day. That's an important skill. Project-based learning is one way to sort of help students exercise that. We live approximately one hour drive away from the world famous uh, Canadian Rockies in Banff, Alberta. 60% of our students who grew up in our city have never been to the mountains. How are you supposed to work on resource issues around the natural world if you have zero connection with the outside world? Once that's been established, we get into project development. So the idea is that they're supposed to take something that they're passionate about and go out and change the world. And 
identify the change within themselves. It's really important for us that our students are in tasks that are very authentic to the world of work, can practice those skills and reflect on their development of those skills. It's increasing the engagement for students and being more of a focus on learning as a process. But then it's the other aspects that we wanted to continue highlighting, um, including life learning and citizenship, um, innovative thinking and action, and then finally transformative leadership. And it kind of goes almost in a Z kind of pattern where we really want to start the foundation around personal academics and develop the character traits that lead to creating those, those leaders of tomorrow to go out and create the change that they want to see. We turn them into entrepreneurial spirit and they've shifted to what, what's exciting to me, what matters to me. Let me find a problem in that area, an issue in that area. I need to then build solutions around that. I then need to prototype those solutions, test them out, see what might be the best solution. And then I have to create a business around that solution. And the students, by the time they're done 12th grade, have actually pitched it like a Shark Tank style, where they actually pitch to investors in our city of Chattanooga, which has a very large entrepreneurial spirit. So Ted, we're actually going to head right into that, the other, what's the difference between PBL and projects? And then after we watch these two videos, I'm going to ask you all to write one thing that sticks with you out of these two videos into the chat box. So if the first video, something really stuck with you, great, throw that in the chat box now, or wait until the next one and then throw something in the chat box afterward. But I'm definitely going to be looking for just a comment from everyone about what stuck with you about the overall arching, what is project-based learning? So this one is, what is the difference between projects and people? Teachers and their students have been doing projects since forever. Three, two, one, more and more are doing project-based learning. So what's the difference? That's a great question. Let's start off by reviewing. <laughs> projects are typically limited in scope and duration. They're a good way for students to work with content they've already learned. Flip to the paper that says sundial. In project-based learning, students learn through the project. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. They address a real-world problem, a driving question, one that can't be Googled and has no single right answer. We were talking about how can we prepare for Atlanta's change in weather. Students have voice and choice in PBL, some input into how they'll answer the driving question. Does anybody think they might have some ideas? So they gain ownership of their learning. So those questions led to our investigation. They collaborate in a process of sustained inquiry, lasting more than a few days. We've got a whole lot of work to do. They reflect on their learning through discussions, formative assessments, and critiques of their peers' work. We are going to take a look at one of your friends' work today. And then revise their work based on those reflections. Now let's see. Okay, okay there we go. We got it. You can type on. The final product is shared with an audience beyond the classroom. Maybe that's professionals in a related field. I appreciated how thoughtfully you responded. Or it could be the kids in the class next door. When students spend an hour exploring the four forces of flight by crafting a Mars lander out of paper, that's a project. When they spend a month simulating a Mars landing, analyzing the math and physics at work, and discussing their work with real aerospace engineers. And it sounds like you've done a little bit of testing to see if that works. Yeah. That's project-based learning. Capiche? Capiche. Research shows that rigorous PBL can result in higher engagement and deeper content knowledge. Keep it up, okay? Learn more about project based learning at edutopia.org. Okay, y'all. So just take a second, and out of those two videos, I want you to throw in one thing that stuck out to you. Robert, I like that about the collaboration between the classroom and the outside world. Absolutely. Like the big thing about PBL that differs from 
PBL and then just regular projects is the is that specific connection is like how are we making this very real world for the students so we're not just culminating a learning activity but we're really teaching them things that they'll have to do out in the real world thanks for sharing that one what else stuck out to y'all Yep, with that audience piece that they actually are presenting their work, that it's not just something that's in isolation. I mean, when we think about our jobs in general, I mean, we present our work daily to our students. And when you think about companies and the work they'll have to do there, they're sharing out their work, whether to small teams or rather to a whole corporation. So those are big ones. Yep, the right or wrong solutions. I think we talked about that so much earlier in the video, but you know when you think about the food truck project they'll do there's no right or wrong solution it's just what was your way of thinking about it and how are we promoting and pushing creativity heather i love to hear your students are already doing that that's great and that is true it's like really thinking about the whole child and like learning through the project versus just showing the project as their way of showing their learning That's one of my favorite quotes too. They can't solve problems if we don't give them problems. Absolutely accurate. Because when we're looking at different places that they'll work in, they want them to identify what's a problem and then how do we solve it. But if we don't practice them doing that, then that's much harder for them when they get into the world of work. These are great, y'all. Thank you for sharing these. And so honestly, you all have like really hit the nail on the head for the big takeaway. So Ted, you can head to the next one because that spoon feed piece is true. Like we really, the goal is not to spoon feed them. So if you look at this um, graphic, you'll see how project-based learning that piece really works, where they're really learning a concept, they're applying on it, they're acting on it, they're reflecting on it. That is the circle that they go through the entire time. So as we're giving them something to think about, they're looking through the concept, then they're figuring out how do I apply this, then they're creating a plan for it. And then we really spend that time on reflection. Really make sure you actually add in that reflection time because that piece is, you know, as important to project-based learning as the presenting, that they have time to reflect on what they're doing and then refine. Those reflection cycles are very key to that experiential piece of project-based learning. And so sometimes people ask us, well, why are there so many projects? But that piece is for them to actually what we talked about before. So we're not spoon feeding them and we're giving them problems to solve. So they're able to apply and learn through these projects. And the only way to keep doing that is to keep giving it to them. You can head to the next one, Ted. This is the gold standard for PBL. So this is a site I want people to be able to bookmark. So there's a site called PBL Works that we're about to view in just a second. But if you look on the right, this is something that would help to be up in your room. So it's called the gold standard for project-based learning and it has the seven design elements that are part of any PBL project, most of which you've already named in the chat box. So are we offering students a, a challenging problem or question? So are we throwing that out to them? Do we give them a period of time where they can work for sustained inquiry? Oops. Oh, there we go. Is it something that's authentic? Does it allow them to have that voice? We just talked about that reflection piece and having the time to reflect and then critique and revise. And then that public audience piece. Every PBL project should have these seven essential design elements. If those aren't present, then it's really not a PBL project. So make sure you have those up somewhere. Honestly, I when I was doing um, PBL in classrooms, this is something my students knew because it was up on the wall. So it's not a bad thing to maybe think of having up on your wall at all times, because you really are, this is what you're doing all the time. You're going through this, the, this wheel all the time with them. So we're gonna click on PBL works and we're actually gonna view a PBL project that somebody did that's outside of the ones that we're gonna be doing so you can get a look. So this website, it's free to sign up for. It's called pblworks.org. If you're somebody that's newer to project-based learning, PBL Works is an awesome resource. I can't um, articulate enough how great of a resource it really is. So Ted, will you go up to the top for me real quick? So it takes you through not only what is PBL and why does it exist, but then Ted, if you click on for me the projects and resources, 
I'm just over there. Yeah. So if you like scroll down a little bit for us, you'll see that there's, they always have featured projects that you can use, but then they'll have like actual project planners and other resources that you can use yourself in PBL in general. So this is a website, I won't spend too long on it, but it's a website that's worth examining if project-based learning is not necessarily your background. Um, because it really does walk you through step by step and provide some amazing resources because I very much like I'm sure most of you don't believe in having to reinvent the wheel. Some people have spent some a lot of time on this and have created some awesome things for us to use. So we are actually after you kind of like write that website down. We are going to go back to our slide and then you're going to actually get to see one of the PBL projects in action. And then if you'll just as you're looking through this type into the chat box how you see this the design elements present in this particular project. So this one's called the March Through Nashville. And remember the seven design elements as we're going through it. So you can type into the chat box which of those design elements you're seeing in this particular project. How can we as historians design a virtual civil rights museum app that will preserve the Nashville influence on the civil rights movement? So throughout this whole process, I want you to think of yourself as a historian. The students are going to create a virtual museum app looking at the civil rights movements that happened in Nashville. So we're going to focus on the Nashville sit-ins, we're going to focus on the public desegregation of schools, and we're going to focus on what happened after the Nashville civil rights movement. It was the most deeply rooted in nonviolence. The app we're using is called Think Link. All the students find a background picture that relates to their topic. And then what they do is they tag different things on top of that background picture. So our entry event was a field trip to our Nashville Public Library, and there they have the civil rights exhibit. I want you guys to look at the pictures. Look at who's in the middle, look at who's on the sides, look at their faces, at their hands, and try to figure out what's happening. We looked at some primary sources. This one by John F. Kennedy. That is John Lewis about to get arrested and he is telling the police his rights. The kids were able to look at some artifacts and have a discussion about the things that happened during the civil rights movement here in Nashville. How do you feel about touching something that was is almost 50 years old? History in the palm of your hand. My job as a teacher is to get them excited like I'm excited about the project. And that's one way to engage the students and get their minds to start thinking about what they're going to create. And now we're going to look at a particular book. This book is going to guide our work for our project. We started looking at the book March by John Lewis. And in this book, he talks about his journey from childhood to the civil rights movement and the part that he played. And then it tells me the story is called March. So why do you think the author did it that way? To, to, to show you the point of view of how he, how it started off when he was marching. Okay, so you think he's giving us his point of view. Oh, he said point of view. Let's talk about point of view. What types of point of view do we have? First, 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 so first person, second, second person, third, 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 third omniscient. Third. I thought that would be a really good okay, idea if so we read his book to get our minds set on what actually happened in Nashville. We got to create our need to know list. And, and then we created our need to know to list. This is the things that they want to know from reading about John Lewis from our field trip. What's your question? I was John Lewis remain a devoted advocate of the philosophy of nonviolence. This is a list what they want to find out at the end. So we're going to go through that list. We're going to mark through the things that we found out. We could always add to the list. The clock is a way for my students to collaborate and talk to each other. So what I do is we set appointments. I learned that the lunch counter, you know, the lunch counter we were sitting at was lunch counter in the city. So it's just a way for them to get feedback, talk to each other, get them to move, stay on topic, but talk to one of your classmates. So that's why I use the clock. I want you to take about a few minutes to journal down what did you learn, how was the experience, what did you like, what did you want more of. So just Reflecting is a big part for me because that gets them to think. During this time in my classroom I have different levels of students where they're at and this book is a kind of a higher level book. So 
they read silently, and after they read silently, then they journal about what they learned. And I think reading and writing go hand to hand. That has them be able to retain the information about the book. This was the first day of school in Nashville in 1957. This was the first day that African American children and white children went to school together. We invited Dr. Melnick from the Historical Commission, and she was able to take what we had already learned and add to it. This lady right here with the glasses, this is Diane Nash. I did like the fact that she did bring in some more primary sources and pictures, which was very enlightening for our kids. Explain to me how that photo goes with your topic, because I see Martin Luther King and they look like Lyndon B. Johnson. So does that go with school segregation? So that means this is a scratch. I think having her there actually helped me as a teacher realize that my students were kind of off topic a little bit. So with me having to do a checkpoint saying, okay, let me look at your pictures to see, are you kind of on the same pathway that she was on? And my kids wasn't. During our work time, the kids continue to work on the app, adding their tags, adding more information to what they want to display for their virtual museum app. My topic is Nashville cities, and I chose this background picture because it's showing a really detailed sitting that they did. They also did a charrette protocol, and with a charrette protocol allowed them to talk to a peer that's not on their team and get feedback. What do I need to add to my app? What do I need to delete? This is interesting because how you put pictures on what you can see most. The presenter is now listening to all this feedback and suggestions. And this gives the students an opportunity to get feedback other than from an adult. I chose this background picture of the citizens because this tells you about the citizens and they're not using violence. This is where they learned their techniques on how to not be violent. We had a panel today of six people. I had one person from our school, which was our media specialist. I had two historians, a TSU professor and Dr. Melnick, who was here with us before from the Historical Commission. And then I had three central office people. Um, one worked with technology, one was from the STEM department, and the other is from our social studies department. I asked them to come in and listen to the kids present. I wonder if you guys are aware that many of the Freedom Riders are still around. I and my expectation was for them to use the presentation rubric from the Buck Institute and give the kids feedback. You've made it really relevant and easy to navigate around with all the images, the pictures, the videos that you found and you put right in there. So I think that's the most important part for the kids because now it gets me to thinking using that feedback that you got from your peers and from the panel. What do you want to change before you submit it to me for a grade? What I learned from this was that Nashville has a lot of history and it's not all about country music. <laughs> Benefit for me to have them present in front of a panel is to showcase themselves. I think sometimes the kids that I service don't have that opportunity to shine. Many of the sites that are important in the story are still around. You can visit the public square where Diane Nash confronted Mayor West. And it's real interesting because when you go to these places, you get a kind of a sense of what they went through. We can actually go right into the next slide, Ted, because just looking at the chat box, you all hit everything I was going to say, um, which I thank you. So, Snaps, I appreciate that. The, I think those, if you ever just kind of want to see, am I hitting the mark on PBL in a very visual way? They have, I mean, the tiny house is another great one, but PBL Works just has some really great visualizations. It's also interesting if you have a class that's thinking, how does this look for us? to find one of your favorite PBL work projects to show them this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about what project-based learning looks like. So it's a really great place to go for some very easy visuals. Um, we can actually skip this slide, Ted. We've talked a lot about what the different tasks look like in those pieces, and we can head right into these. So the some very specific aspects of classroom culture we're gonna talk about for the rest of this. Um, classroom culture, classroom routines, just things that make up a very PBL-centered classroom. Um, so we can, you can kind of go through this slide, Ted. You can actually go to the next one. We're talking about kind of what are the tenets of strong classroom culture. We're actually not gonna play this video. We're just kind of gonna talk about this one. Um, you can head to the next one, Ted. 
I want to focus on this slide. So we talked we talked about the uh, the gold standard of what project based learning is. And so this is really the tenets of how to build a strong classroom culture. So this again goes very much back to that gold standard, but the idea that there's norms that are co-crafted by yourself and your students. So thinking less about a classroom that has rules of these are the mandates of my classroom. You know, there's rules we have to follow in the school so them understanding that, but having them actually sit down in your classroom and co-craft the norms with you. The norms of our classroom, you know, are things that we value creativity. We want students to realize there's no wrong answer. We want you to share your opinions. Now, what, what are norms that you want to have with your classroom? So guiding them on some norms that you might want to make sure they see, but letting them be involved in the process so that they're bought into the culture of your classroom. What we saw in the video, really allowing student voice and choice, making that something that's an active part of your classroom, that students know that your voice matters in this room and that I am allowing you choice in this room because you're gonna be allowed choice in the world. And so I want you to have an opportunity to practice that understanding of what it means to have choice and make decisions based on your choices. Um, having a classroom where students understand that in this classroom, I'm not, so, you know, I'm not standing in front of the classroom giving you directions all day. I'm allowing you to collaborate. I'm allowing you to work with your peers. I'm allowing you to be in the driver's seat of your learning. That is something that looks different often in a PBL classroom because your students don't get a ton of direction from you. You're giving them these overarching questions and you're actually allowing them to really think for themselves and be creative in the process. So letting them know that that's something that you really expect to see from them. PBL classrooms have that highly collaborative piece. So making sure they understand that like that's something that they're gonna be doing all the time. Um, that piece that we talked about about the no right or wrong answers and then that piece about critique and revise, critique and revise, critique and revise. So students understand that just because we this is what you present once, the process of actually getting feedback and then giving you the opportunity to revise it. That's something that they'll do often at work. And so that's something that we want them to practice doing in this classroom as we try to build upon their skills and push them in the 21st century skills. So this would be a slide that I would even go over with your students and then think about how are you going to go through the process of setting norms with them. You can head to the next one, Ted. We just kind of talked about this, the norms are different from rules piece. And then you can actually head to the next one that shows you what some different teacher norms are and some different student norms. So guiding your students to some of these that they can understand that this is what I'm promising. And this is kind of what you're promising. This is what we're promising each other as we head into this class together this year because we're gonna give the best of ourselves as we work together as a class. So these are some that students and teachers have come up with that have been helpful. But again, going back to that gold standard, how are you pushing those um, in a way that students can understand that norming in your classroom? So just think through how you wanna do that, but make sure you make some time and some space to do it with your students because it really lays a strong foundation for your class moving into project-based learning. We can head to the next one, Ted. This is the physical environment. So as we think about the culture, the culture we have is, is, is incredibly important, but the physical space is as well. So thinking about the fact that your students are working in groups, right? So just having the, the just rows doesn't really make as much sense because they need space to actually collaborate. So how do we think about creating space in our classroom for them to work together? Are we gonna put tables in groups of four? You know, if some I've seen some classrooms that are very lucky to have like, you know, rolling chairs, which makes things much easier as you're shifting around. Some classrooms are in a computer lab, right? So how do you kind of rope off space? So it's like, this is kind of our project working space. So it's clear that students have a more collaborative environment versus a more lecture-based environment. So thinking about how do you have spaces that they can work on? Do they have like whiteboards that can become their project boards? Do they have poster boards where they can hang stuff up on? What are the limitations of your classroom and how can you work around those? So as the teacher, it's really important for you to give yourself some space to really think about what does my classroom look like and how can I make it more of a workspace where students know this is actually like a collaborative workshop versus a lecture-based environment. Ted, you can head to the next one. This is a big one. So this one is one of the ones that really should be present in all of our classrooms when we're in a PBL classroom. The project wall is huge. So the project wall is really a way 
um, for students to stay organized. They also have project walls almost in almost every profession you go to. So when we were at the different, when we were at um, Placid at the power at the plant, they had a project wall of like the different tasks that needed to be accomplished, who was working on what task, what needed to be done by when, just as much as they did at one of the restaurants where it said exactly what needed to be done, who needed to do it, when it needed to be done by. The project wall is a way for your students to stay organized around the plethora of projects that they're gonna take on. And them understanding what the essential question is, what the needs to knows are, the different resources. And this is something that should be a living document um, for each of the kids. So there's actually an example. Ted, if you'll go to the next slide. So the next two slides we're gonna look at are different examples. So this was an example one teacher did that had the project wall for one of their groups, right? So it had the driving question, it had the calendar, question and answer, task list. So there are teachers who will do one of these for like each group. Each group has their own project wall. Some teachers do it as like, this is the project wall for the unit. Either way, it's like, how do we stay organized around this unit and allow students to develop some organizational skills around accomplishing tasks to gear towards a rubric and drive towards the guiding question. So think about how you want that to look in your room. So this is one example. And then Ted, if you move to the next slide. This is another example where it's on like a tri board, right? So if you didn't wanna just have like one up in your room, each group could have their own tri board for a PBL wall. So you see how it's, you know, you have your team members, their roles, the contract, and then you have the products they're using, the different handouts, and then you have the driving question, the descriptions, and the tasks in the middle. So this could be something that you give every group for each type when they're doing different projects together. So they actually have something that they're working off of. So when you say head into your groups, let's get to work today, they pull this out and it's very clear what they're working on. So this is an easy way to make sure that they kind of stay organized and on top of it, and that they have actionable items that they're doing each day. So as the teacher, you know, going around to each of these and saying, okay, what's on your project wall for today? What are you all getting into? What part of the project are you working on? It allows them to stay organized and also for you to give them some checkpoints. But it gives them kind of a great visual. Um, there's other really good examples on the Buck Institute that kind of show you different types of project walls, but these are two really good ones um, to model after if you've never used one before. We're gonna head into the next one. So this third area, and we're actually, Chad, if you go to the next one for me. So these are thinking through, oh, I don't know why I didn't show all of them. Oh, there we go. Okay, so these are thinking through the different um, protocols in your classroom. So at this point, we talked about what your classroom culture looks like, setting the norms. We talked about the actual physical space of what your classroom needs to kind of be set up differently to accomplish the means of project-based learning, as well as how they can have project calls. These are protocols and routines. Some of us, I'm sure, have used these before. Most of us have used Think, Pair, Share. Um, a lot of us have used morning meetings. The morning meetings are really, or you know, period meetings, whatever you want to call it, um, just so that they have a way to like spend some time as a community talking about what we're going to do for the day. Think pair share is obviously a great conversation piece to go through. Um, a lot of us have done gallery walks before, so we can actually see students work and also have that feedback piece in. That's a really great way if you have the project boards for students to be able to go along and offer feedback on each other's projects is a great way to do that. Um, having a time where students can give each other uh, celebrations really adds to the culture of your classroom. Um, having students be able to have some sort of a closing routine where you all come back together. Same thing with like the meeting at the beginning. It's really great to have a meeting and a closure so that while you're going through all these different pieces, because they're doing a lot independently and a lot in groups. So having a very clear routine of let's open like this, let's close like this. The meeting is nice to kind of set the tone and the closure is nice to add in the reflection as well as the celebration sat in the good environment. So kind of look through that list. Again, it's gonna be on the PowerPoint that's sent out, but this is a nice way to think through what are the routines in your classroom. Because, the, because PBL is calling for your students to have those high level of independence and for us to be a little bit more hands off, it's good for students to have strong routines so they know what is expected of them at each part of the classroom. 
Thank you, Ted. You can head to the next one. This is a really big one. So we're heading into the contracts. Um, they're going to be using team contracts, just like we have contracts with our school systems. You know, we want our students to be able to have contracts as a team. So um, Ted, you can head to the next slide so they can kind of see exactly what those look like. Um, what you will see is there, you'll see the team contract template is actually opened up when we go into unit two. And so unit two is when we talk about developing team. So you'll see the contract template and the matrix template. So those are when we really start to talk about what do we agree upon as a team. So that's when you're actually having them sit down and they're going to write out these contracts. So if you're having them switch groups each project, then they're writing new contracts for each project. If you're having them stay in the same group, we're following this contract for each project that we do together. So the contracts are things they come up with, similar to the norm that they come up with as a class, the different norms. But this is more focused on, as, as a working team, what is the contract that we're making? So making sure you actually read through the template and the matrix so that you kind of have a chance to explore with them what that looks like and even creating a strong sample so they understand what what you're looking for in terms of the depth that you want them to go into when they're making a contract with each other you can go to the next one ted you can actually play this one so people can see like the importance of the contracts the contracts you're going to use in almost every single one of the units so i really want people to feel like they have a strong understanding of what those look like Where do you guys stand so far? Has anyone posted and completed it? Nice job. Contract is a very important tool because we find if you don't have any norms to come back to, there's no ground to stand on when you're trying to address a problem other than people's personal perspectives. I don't feel like we could like implement that somewhere. We started at the beginning of the year with the students creating classroom-wide norms. And then every time they get a new team, they create team norms. And so that's right down to the detail of if someone's absent, what can you expect from them as far as communication? Do you expect them to respond to emails? In what time period? But whatever it is, there needs to be a means of communication. They also, in their contract, determine how they're gonna make decisions, whether by consensus or majority vote or some other system. They need to agree on all of these parameters. So, you know, I'll make the Google Doc folder if you make the Echo one. And using the contract is something that is really hard to do in the beginning and holding people accountable is very hard to do when you first come to Tech Valley. It's something that you're not used to doing. You don't have to in a traditional school. You just, it's all about me and my grade needs to be good. But as soon as you get here, the first thing you do is you get thrown into a group and all of a sudden you have to worry about yourself and two to three other people as problems arise and you address them through the contract, usually it's on a warning system, so you don't do your work one day, you get a warning. And after three warnings, they're actually fired from the team. They have to complete the project on their own. So students are motivated not to get fired because it's very daunting to do a four-person project by yourself. So you guys all set with your deadlines? But we do support them in asking the question after they, when they're issuing a warning, well, why did that happen? And how, what could the team do to support that person in the future so that breakdown of communication or accountability you know, doesn't repeat itself? Excellent. You're on track. So that kind of outlines, like, as, as the teacher, how you were kind of explaining it to your students. And then I'm going to ask Ted to pull up for us the actual sample of the team contract that you'll see in unit two. So if you, if you wanna kind of follow this with us, if you wanna to go to the units and then actually go into unit two, you'll see exactly what, the, what it looks like. So it should be in the, in the final unit set in unit two in the projects. I think it's an A.
But there we go. So if you all kind of look at this, you'll see that they have the team name. It's a very simple document, but it's very important that they actually go through it. So like as the participants, we agree to the type of communication. So we agree, you know, that we are going to communicate weekly via email. We're going to send a check in email to each other. We're going to make sure we fill out this at the end of class, whatever they agree to about ways to communicate. Um, for meetings, same thing. What do we agree to? If you'll scroll down real quick for me, Ted. How do we agree to conduct ourselves? If we have conflict, this is one of the most important ones I've tend to see. If we have conflict, what are we agreeing to? And then for deadlines, what do we agree to? And then everyone signs it. You know, I've seen situations before where you'll have students who, you know, they'll all go through this and they'll have one student who maybe is absent a lot so they'll have a group meeting if they'll ask the teacher to come into and say you know we agree that you know you're not pulling your weight because of x y and z it kind of gives them this foundation to go back to and feel that ownership that we as a group are kind of agreeing to these things together like i said i would definitely have some sort of a sample that you show students afterward after they do their first round of it so that you can give them that feedback to be able to revise and update if maybe they didn't make it as specific as you wanted them to on the first round of it so that's kind of the last piece for us. I know that was a lot very quickly. I appreciate you all hanging in there um, because we did in two hours and 15 minutes what we typically do over two days. So you did get a ton of information, um, but I appreciate you all. I mean, you were very active in the chat and I hope that you got a good bit out of this as you embark on teaching the course. Please know that you can always reach out to us for questions. Um, concerns, ideas. Um, Ted put his email up there. I can definitely also type mine into the chat um, if you have questions as you go along the way. And then if you will do us a favor and then just make sure to fill out the survey. It always um, helps us just make sure that we are serving you in the best way possible because we want to make sure this course is something that students feel like they are really getting the most out of and you feel really supported in as a teacher. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Ted, did you have anything before we signed off for the night? Uh, so just uh, at, at midnight tonight, uh, the email to set to go off for registration, don't feel like you have to stay up to register tonight. It'll still be in your inbox tomorrow, but uh, please register as soon as possible so we can get an accurate count for the training in September. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, just please remember, you know, that you have priority and you have a week to check in and register for the training before those slots are released uh, uh, statewide. The training is going to be on September 16th and 17th in Baton Rouge at the Claiborne building, but all those details will be on the Eventbrite registration link. But I have uh, no further information. Uh, please, if you feel like it, just reach out to me if you need anything, any questions, any concerns, and I'll be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. But I want you all to have a great night and thank you so much for attending this. Oh, and the link for the webinar will be on the LDO website uh, tomorrow by 5 p.m. And that's all. Have a great night. <laughs>